Welcome, I'm Katherine Hadro, and this is EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. The nation bids farewell to a legal lioness. What her passing could mean for the future of Roe versus Wade. We talked to a leading member of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Today I'm announcing that I will be signing the Born Alive Executive Order. President Trump makes a pro-life announcement at the National Catholic Prayer Breakfast. We tell you more. And pro-life Democrats use the country's so-called newspaper of record to send a stern message to a presidential nominee, Joe Biden. The late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg will lie in state at the U.S. Capitol this week the first woman ever accorded that honor. The Supreme Court Justice died at the age of 87 last Friday from pancreatic cancer after serving on the high court for 27 years. ...of the office on which I am about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was the second woman to serve on the U.S. Supreme Court. Known as a trailblazer, Ginsburg tied for first in her class at Columbia Law School and will likely be remembered for her work in bringing down legal barriers to women's advancement in American society. Justice Ginsburg was also a friend to an unlikely fellow Supreme Court judge, the late Justice Antonin Scalia. While Ginsburg, who is Jewish, did not always see eye to eye with Scalia, a conservative judge and Roman Catholic, their friendship bridged their ideological divide. And what's not to like? <laughs> Except her views of the law, of course. <laughs> but Ginsburg, or RBG as she came to be called, is also an icon for abortion advocacy groups. The late justice consistently penned opinions in favor of abortion and contraception, and in a rare move for judges, Ginsburg even openly voiced her support for abortion during her 1993 it's, it's, Senate confirmation hearing. This is something central to a woman's life, to her dignity. It's a decision that she must make for herself. And when government controls that decision for her, she is being treated as less than a fully adult human responsible for her her own choices. Joining us now from Capitol Hill is Senator Mike Lee of Utah. He is a member of the Senate Judiciary Committee and is also on President Trump's list of potential Supreme Court nominees. Senator, welcome back. First, can you share your thoughts on the passing of the late Justice Ginsburg? Justice Ginsburg was a talented, gifted lawyer and jurist. She rendered opinions that I sometimes agreed with and often did not agree with. Nevertheless, I admire her skill and her contribution. My thoughts and prayers are with her and her family. Senator, both you and your brother, Associate Utah Supreme Court Justice Thomas Lee, are on the president's list of potential Supreme Court nominees. President Trump has indicated he is going to nominate a woman, but if he were to offer it to you, would you accept? Sure. It's not something I would turn down. It's not going to be me. It's not going to be my brother. It is going to be Amy Coney Barrett. I believe, and uh, if it is, I will wholeheartedly support that nomination. As you mentioned, Senator, two judges considered to be front runners to replace Justice Ginsburg are judges Amy Coney Barrett and Judge Barbara Lagoa, both of whom are Catholic women. Senator, we've seen multiple instances of some of your Democratic colleagues on the Senate Judiciary Committee, including now Vice Presidential nominee Kamala Harris, question judicial nominees over issues related to their Catholic faith. What is your message to your colleagues on the Senate Judiciary Committee if they are planning to raise concerns over a nominee's Catholic faith? Now, first of all, there are two independent provisions of the Constitution that prohibit that. Article 6 of the Constitution prohibits us from, from imposing religious tests and the Establishment Clause, uh, uh, together with the Free Exercise Clause of the First Amendment, uh, also would suggest that would be inappropriate on our part. Uh, the religious beliefs of a nominee need to be respected. They are sacred. And they're none of the Judiciary Committee's darn business. 
So if they do raise that, they will do so at their own peril. I don't know whether they can resist the impulse to do that. There is a, an impulse among many uh, progressive members of the left. Um, uh, nonetheless, if they do that, it's only going to turn people off and it's only going to strengthen our resolve to confirm this nominee. You support a quick vote on the president's Supreme Court nominee. Senator, can you put into context how significant you think this moment in history is for the pro-life movement and the courts? It's a very significant moment. Uh, president Trump has campaigned, uh, promising to appoint textualists, originalists to the Supreme Court. Uh, people in the pattern of Justice Scalia, for whom Amy Coney Barrett clerked, Justice Alito, for whom I clerked, and Justice Thomas. And uh, Amy Coney Barrett is, is squarely in that pattern uh, and is someone who could serve on the court for 30, 40, who knows, 50 years. She will have a very significant impact on the court, and that impact will include making rulings on all kinds of issues that are important to the American people. What are assurances you want to hear, Senator, from the Supreme Court nominee when it comes to his or her judicial stance on Roe versus Wade? Typically, a nominee won't refer to taking a position on a particular line of reasoning or a particular decision, particularly if it's a frequently litigated line of cases. Uh, there are judicial canons of ethics that preclude them from doing so. And so that kind of commentary usually isn't possible, uh, uh, and many would say, uh, nor would it be desirable in a judicial confirmation hearing, particularly where the nominee is herself a sitting federal judge. Nonetheless, one can look at uh, a particular nominee's writings, uh, scholarship, uh, opinions in the case of a sitting jurist, and discern something about how that nominee approaches the law, whether she's there to interpret the law based on what the law says, as we would want, uh, or on the other hand, whether she's there to reinterpret the law and remake it in her own image as she wishes it had been written. The former is appropriate, the latter is inappropriate. Mm -hmm. We are expecting this Supreme Court confirmation uh, to be contentious. Uh, Senator, how much of this national divide do you think ultimately comes down to Roe v. Wade at the Supreme Court? Certainly a lot of it surrounds uh, Roe v. Wade and, and the, the contention that the Supreme Court injected into the political discussion in this country at the time that it decided to take this debatable matter beyond debate, uh, a, a matter uh, best suited to a political conversation within the political branches primarily to occur within the states and not the federal government uh, in 1973. So yeah, the Supreme Court unquestionably politicized itself when it did that. Unfortunately, it was neither the beginning nor the end of the leftist politicization of the judicial branch of government. And that's one of the reasons why this nomination is so important. Mm. President Trump said he will make his announcement on Saturday. Who would you say your pick is? on his list of potential nominees? Uh, the, the president's considering some very talented individuals. Uh, and uh, I, I believe he should pick, and I believe he will pick, Amy Coney Barrett, the judge serving on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit in Indiana. Uh, I, I think she's the right one. Uh, while he has not made his announcement, uh, my own prediction is that that's who he will pick. Excellent. Well, we will all be watching closely. Senator Mike Lee of Utah in the Senate Judiciary Committee, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Joining us now via Skype is Prudence Robertson, Communications Associate for the Susan B. Anthony List. Welcome, Prudence. First, what's your reaction to the death of the late Justice Ginsburg? Yes, well, first, on behalf of the entire SBA List team, we offer our sincere condolences to the family of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and we are praying for the repose of her soul. Uh, we recognize this moment as very profound historically, uh, and we see it as a pivot point for our movement and for our nation and for unborn children, with Ruth Bader Ginsburg being a reliable pro-abortion vote for the past 27 years. With her passing, we see an opportunity to protect life in a stronger way on the court by filling this vacancy with a strong pro-life justice. So uh, we are deeply encouraged and we are energized and ready to confirm a new justice and fill this seat as quickly as we can. 
Prudence, I understand your group's President Marjorie Dannenfelser spoke with President Trump this week about the Supreme Court. What did he have to say and what can you share with us? Yes, Marjorie and the president did speak, and we established that we are on the exact same page with the president in uh, agreeing that this seat needs to be filled before the election. Uh, Marjorie and the president discussed his list of potential Supreme Court nominees, a list that's filled with all-stars, and we've identified that Judge Amy Barrett is a particularly great candidate for this position. She has already been vetted, and she's known to the pro-life grassroots. And seeing her nominated and eventually confirmed to the court would really serve as such a balm to pro-lifers, especially persuadable pro-life voters who aren't sure whether or not they are going to vote for President Trump in the coming weeks. Seeing her confirmed, or truly any of the justices, or I'm sorry, judges on the list, would uh, remind us all of President Trump's continued fulfillment of his promise to to confirm pro-life judges and justices and the fact that he's come through on so many other promises to the pro-life movement. Prudent, speaking of the president, President Trump made a pro-life announcement at the National Catholic Prayer Breakfast this week saying he is going to sign a born alive executive order. What more can you tell us? Well, Catherine, we are very thankful to the president for taking this bold action. And through this, he really is simply advocating for the protection of all babies, especially uh, and including babies that are born extremely prematurely. Uh, and in addition, reminding people that parents have a right to demand protection for their unborn children and children that are born, uh, regardless of the circumstances of that birth. So we're very grateful for this bold action and, you know, President Trump's unprecedented protection of life. Prudence, looking forward ahead in the next few weeks, everyone is expecting a contentious Supreme Court confirmation battle. How much of this divide verse comes down to Roe versus Wade, do you think? Well, it's clear that Roe v. Wade is on the line here, and that really just underscores, uh, you know, the fact that pro-abortion Democrats, they have everything to lose here. And just as a reminder, at the end of the battle to confirm Justice Kavanaugh to the court, uh, Professor Blasey Ford's lawyer even came forward and admitted that uh, Professor Blasey Ford came forward with her story specifically because of Roe versus Wade. So it really is true that Roe v. Wade is a determining factor here and uh, that pro-abortionists, pro-abortion leaders have everything to lose. And that's why we see them, you know, they've already said that nothing is off the table in terms of stopping this confirmation. They've already said that they're going to try to stack the courts and even try to impeach the president again. But pro-lifers must not flinch, and we must continue to pray for the courage to fight this fight and, and to win. This will be something we're watching closely in the coming weeks. Prudence Robertson with the Susan B. Anthony List. Thank you. Thanks so much. President Trump says he will announce his Supreme Court nominee to replace the late Justice Ginsburg on Saturday. That means the race to fill the vacant Supreme Court seat before Election Day will soon be underway. The president has said he would only appoint justices who uphold the Constitution and do not legislate an abortion agenda from the bench. This could have major repercussions for the pro-life movement. And that brings us to this week's call to action. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com to tell your senators to confirm President Trump's Supreme Court nominee. Because pro-lifers currently have majority in the Senate, confirming a new justice is a real possibility before Election Day. But we've seen confirmation battles before, and we know they can be and are contentious. Make sure to let your senators know you want to see a constitutionalist justice who upholds the right to life. Urge your senators to hold a swift confirmation by going to ProLifeWeekly.com. The process to appoint and confirm a justice is quickly putting the abortion debate at the forefront of the nation. If the Senate confirms a new Supreme Court justice, this will be the third justice President Trump has appointed in his first term. It would also bring the number of judges who are considered conservative to six, increasing speculation that overturning Roe v. Wade is within reach. The two names that keep coming to the top of Trump's likely nominees are Judges Barbara Lagoa and Amy Coney Barrett. Both women are Catholic, and his pick will be announced on Saturday. Lagoa, a daughter of Cuban immigrants, has spoken about the importance of her Catholic faith in her own life. 
And Coney Barrett, a Catholic wife and mother of seven, first rose to prominence during her confirmation hearing in 2017, when Senator Feinstein questioned her on her Catholic faith. When you read your speeches, um, the conclusion one draws is that the dogma lives loudly within you. And that's of concern when you come to big issues that large numbers of people have fought for for years in this country. Joining us now via Skype is Helen Alvare, a professor of law at Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University. She is also a member of the Holy See's Dicastery for Laity, Family and Life and cooperates with the Permanent Observer Mission of the Holy See to the United Nations as a speaker and delegate to various UN conferences concerning women and the family. Helen, it's an honor to welcome you. First, as both a Catholic and a legal expert, what do you think the late Justice Ginsburg's Supreme Court legacy will be? You know, it, it's such a mixed legacy of ensuring that women were taken to be equal uh, in so many fields with men. And at the same time, she's so championed by some for her dogged attachment uh, to abortion and more recently her, you know, discomfort with religious freedom. The national conversation is quickly turning to Roe v. Wade and the possibility that having a sixth conservative justice on the bench means we are closer to overturning it. Can you speak, Helen, to why Roe's judicial reasoning is problematic? And can you clarify, where did Justice Ginsburg stand on Roe? So try not to be too legally annoying here. Roe versus Wade is built on a phrase in the 14th Amendment to the Constitution about the right to due process. It's supposed to protect rights that you know, even if they're not mentioned in the Constitution, are just assumed to be so much a part of the history and fabric of the United States that we wouldn't be free without them. Roe versus Wade and Casey take a country where abortion was completely illegal in every state and territory, with the exception of very few cases, and call abortion a fundamental constitutional 14th Amendment right. It's clearly ridiculous. It's the opposite. Of, of the correct holding. So when people talk about conservative justices, they mean justices who will actually read the Constitution as it is intended. Uh, Justice Ginsburg felt that the right to abortion should have been located not in the due process, but the equal protection part of the 14th Amendment, because without abortion, she thought women could not be equal. Do we know where Ginsburg stood on Roe? She was, the word a fan, the words dogged protector, <laughs> don't even begin um, to describe her attachment to abortion. Um, she felt the same way about contraception, that if women did not have the right to avoid pregnancy or to, to terminate um, the life of their unborn child, they simply could not be free and equal economically uh, socially, philosophically in the United States. Mm. Um, I, I, it's just such a great sadness for so many of us that her brilliant cases establishing women's equality were not matched by either, you know, the same faithfulness to the Constitution in the abortion area or any understanding at all of where women actually stand and how abortion actually affects them. Mm. Helen, Judge Amy Coney Barrett is said to be a front-runner on the president's list of potential Supreme Court nominees to replace Ginsburg. What do you make of the commentary in the media we're seeing about Barrett's Catholic faith, and how does being Catholic actually play into being a judge? Yeah. Um, that's a huge question. Really, I think it boils down to a fear that a Justice Barrett would overturn Roe. When, when the court steps in, and makes a decision that's not the courts to make. It, it belongs with legislators. There's no constitutional right to abortion by any stretch of the imagination. It ignites a huge fight and, of course, has turned all later confirmation battles into, you know, a referendum in the Senate over abortion. Um, 
to me, the fact that she's Catholic, the fact that we have um, uh, a, a significant number of people who are Catholic or from the Jewish faith on the court, is this incredible testimony to the intelligence <laughs> of these religions. Yes, you know, other religions are very intelligent as well, but the fact that Catholics and Jews have risen to this point in, in the court in the United States, especially in recent times when previously both religions were really kept off the court, um, demonstrates that the people appointing justices think that there's something really geniusy about the marriage of faith and reason in Judaism and Catholicism. Um, I think that's the best perspective on, on the meaning of her faith to her. Also, you know, the role that uh, a, a, a Catholic faith in particular plays for somebody should really encourage people. These are people who believe in a radical equality and dignity of all people, that all people are equal because they're made in God's image, um, that justice is owed to all. Um, our Catholic social teaching ought to be a cause for people cheering when um, a, a kind of serious practitioner of our faith uh, is, is nominated to the court. Um, those are great values mm. for the United mm. States. Thank you for that fascinating insight. Helen Alvare with the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up, Democrats for Life have a message for Joe Biden, and they plastered it all over one of the most influential newspapers in America, their pro-life message to Biden as we enter the last weeks of the presidential campaign. Welcome back to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Katherine Hadro. A nonpartisan organization teams up with abortion advocacy groups to launch an online abortion finder tool. That is this week's Speak Out segment. The group Power to Decide, which claims to be nonpartisan, announced it teamed up with Planned Parenthood and the National Abortion Federation, among other pro-abortion groups, to launch a digital abortion finder tool. The digital tool features more than 750 abortion facilities across the country. On the web page, a woman enters her location and the timing of her cycle, and the results tell her the nearest facility to go get an abortion. The CEO of Power to Decide told Marie Claire magazine, quote, our commitment is to make sure that the abortion finder tool is constantly updated and that we are providing the information that is needed so that people can access abortion services. Abortion is part of health care and should be treated as such. Abortion is not health care, and this digital launch is dangerous news. It's become more and more clear over the years that abortion advocates are not interested in safe, legal, and rare procedures. This online tool does nothing to counsel and care for a woman facing an unplanned pregnancy. Instead, it sends the message that, oh, here, find an abortionist with a few clicks of your mouse, problem solved. It's a sign of a sick society that we instead are not creating easy online tools to help vulnerable women in need, ones that point them in the direction of shelter, resources, financial assistance, or even adoption service information. There are some pro-life groups that are doing phenomenal digital outreach. But let this serve as a reminder to us in the movement, we need to be savvy online because abortion groups are already actively using the digital frontier to reach women in need. Let us reach them first. Readers of the New York Times may have been in for a surprise this past Sunday when they picked up their morning paper and saw a message that they don't often see in the nation's premier newspaper a full-page pro-life message for Joe Biden and the Democratic Party. That is this week's pro-life focus. Take a look at the full-page ad that ran this week in the New York Times Sunday edition. It was bought by Democrats for Life of America, and it includes a letter to the Democratic National Committee, signed by more than 100 current and former elected Democrats urging Joe Biden and the party to moderate its position on abortion. A number of other pro-life groups endorsed the letter, including Pro-Life San Francisco, New Wave Feminists, and Rehumanize International. Kristen Day, executive director of Democrats for Life, tells us why she went to the New York Times to share this bold message. 
the goal of the ad was to let the Democratic Party know that we're serious about our position and making space for ourselves within the Democratic Party. And the ad was a big effort and uh, took you know, people from all over the country coming together and making this possible. So we just want the Democratic Party to know that, no, we're not going anywhere. And two, they have to earn our vote. They have to make space if they want to win elections. Day says she's received a lot of support since the release of the full page ad and says volunteer numbers for Democrats for Life have been up. But when it comes to hearing from Democratic leadership, Day says there has really been no response from the campaign or leadership, even though this was their third public letter in this election. I really do think they're taking this vote for granted. They think that the pro-life Democrats will come out and support Joe Biden regardless of the extreme position on abortion. And he's going to be very surprised in November if he doesn't wake up and realize the importance of this vote. Day is encouraging pro-life Democrats to contact Joe Biden's campaign and voice their concerns for his abortion extremism. Life should not be a partisan issue. I'm grateful to Kristen Day's leadership as she continues to speak truth to power in the Democratic Party. That does it for this edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. Until next time, we'd love to hear from you. Find us on social media at EWTN Pro-Life on all social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, we're there. You can also send us a message by emailing prolifeweekly at EWTN.com. We'd love to hear from you. Remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.